Welcome back to Season 1 TNG. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Picard decides to shake things up by foregoing a captain's log for exposition and instead just telling the exposition straight to the crew. The sun is going to be funky and may screw with their shit. That's the gist of it. So they go to yellow alert, which I just realized might be appropriate for a I'm nervous and may pee my pants a little bit of anticipation. I do have to admit, this is off to a good start, but that's partly due to the novelty of it. We're doing some science, some exploring, there's a little bit of risk. Let's take some steps. You can't do this every week, but this feels more interesting than the usual, okay, fire a probe at it and tell the nerds to keep an eye on it while I read some Shakespeare. <laughs> Damn it, Wesley, we just got all the malware off here from the last time you were watching Tellarite porn. This is happening all over the ship thanks to X-ray bombardment. Captain, the level of tension on the ship is mounting. Should I increase my cleavage to level 2 to compensate? They're heading in closer but are interrupted by a distress signal. There's some freighter in trouble and they head to help out before they fall into the atmosphere and burn up. They arrive after the titles. The freighter is an old POS. By now it's clear whoever wrote this was being paid by the word. The shining moment is when, knowing the shuttle has minutes at most, Picard skips over, one at a time so we can understand, for a long explanation of why only one voice needs to come through with everything short of a PowerPoint on the nature of how sound works. It's like the Enterprise crew is trying to defeat this problem with a filibuster. The guy who is talking is useless, though. His explanation can also be boiled down to just, I think it's fucked. While Data tries to remotely access the computer, they try first a tractor beam, but it's no good. Whatever the sun is doing is messing with it. Luckily, Data figures out the problem. Unluckily, this guy can't fix it. But they have a replacement they can give him. That's lucky. Except he doesn't know how to install it properly. That's unlucky. He's going to go see if anyone around here can install it, though. Maybe they'll get lucky. Well, that's a big note, Burger. So, uh, I'm afraid we just fly these things. We don't do the maintenance. It's probably like a union thing or something. I have to say about all this, it's not unfunny, but man, you could see easily how this scene lends itself to dark comedy with just a, a single rewrite and some Titan direction. We're 10 minutes in, and I'll tell you, this could have been a highly memorable six minutes. This could have been intellectually stimulating, tense, and darkly humorous but it just can't pull it off. The work is intent on using a $10 set of words whenever a nickel's worth could have done better. We're in the transporter room. Great, activate your transporter. Set coordinates 9703 mark 268. Did you say 286 or 886? On the one hand, you gotta appreciate his attempt to be thorough. On the other, I think it's more that he just saw something shiny and knew he might have misheard it. They're linking the transporters together to get enough of a signal to beam them over through the interference. What comes over is a bunch of canisters, not the crew. Riker realizes what they're dealing with and says, screw getting these dipshits onto the pad. Just try to beam them over and we'll see whatever happens to show up. Four people arrive, two of which were in Star Trek II, actually. David Marcus and Khan's number one henchman. Well, at least they can let bygones be bygones. At their insistence, the four are taken to inspect the cargo so that they can begin bickering over it. The two scruffy-looking bastards here say it's theirs, while the two country club-looking ones say it's not because the goods traded for them were lost with that ship. An argument leads to... Ah, the menace of static Klingons. Tush has to give them a little taste of her phaser to get them to stop, and they're dragged off to the conference room. Data explains that the last encounter with the system was 200 years ago, and it seems the two planets have barely developed technologically since then. We have only two left. Neither works properly. They are critical to our survival. Will you fix them? Oh, plot point. Why? Turns out this is a Prime Directive episode. I've gone off on the Prime Directive more than once. So now you're no doubt thinking, Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. I mean, it's a season one episode with the Prime Directive, and Picard even gives a speech on the Prime Directive. Surely this must be another chance for Chuck to vent his spleen on how much he hates it. Not this time. 
I don't have a problem with the Prime Directive in principle. My biggest criticism is that whatever you say about watching while people die and doing nothing, it isn't enlightened. It may be prudent, I won't deny that, but it's not enlightened. Choosing to die for your beliefs is noble. Choosing to let others die for your beliefs is not. This episode differs from others, though, in that the stakes are not the starkness of imminent loss of life. The fate of these two species are kept entirely in their own hands, and if it ends in extinction because they mismanaged it, that's a far cry different from their planet's going to blow up if we don't pour some antacid into a fissure and no one will be the wiser and just head off to read more Shakespeare instead. The Prime Directive is working properly when it's about letting societies shape their own future, even if it's going to lead to inevitable self-destruction. Because maybe it won't. I absolutely recognize the need to let them find their own way, make their own choices, chart their own path, and own whatever happens as a result. So if you do happen to be in the neighborhood and could lend a helping hand, just think about it. I'm not saying you got to intervene in a war or something like that. But if a planet is undergoing climate change and they realize what a mistake they made and they've transformed their whole society to try to resolve it and it's not quite going to work out right and you realize all you got to do is just fart some protons into the atmosphere or something and, and they'll be none the wiser and they'll be able to go on with their society having learned from this mistake. Where's the harm? Uh, don't say we should not play God. That's the harm. I just can't stand painting complacency as a virtue. It's one thing to choose inaction for a specific scenario and admit it as a necessary evil. But when you instead call it wisdom, I'm sorry, but it actually is evil. Be careful in your efforts to avoid playing God as you don't decide in your arrogance to play the devil. Crap, that was a perfect thing to end that on, and now I just realized I said I wasn't going to rant about the Prime Directive, and I ranted anyway. Crap. I bring it on myself sometimes. Doesn't matter. There are only four rules you need to remember. Make the plan, execute the plan, expect the plan to go off the rails, throw away the plan. So with the plan to repair the ships underway, the matter is that of the cargo. Picard says that it's up to their own legal systems to resolve this. But the wrinkle is both sides claim it. And what it is, is medicine to treat a plague. Well, there's a concern, since these two both have it, and they've been walking around the ship. So thanks for that. We're taken to sick bay where the Breckians, uh, that's the pair where he looks like he should be swatting a servant with a golfing glove, and she's strangely proud of her obliques. The Breckians have no sign of the disease. The Anarans show signs of being sick, but no cause. Weird. The Anarans beg for the treatment and assert that Thousands on the planet below are going through the same suffering, which could be a sign of how much their population has dwindled, or it could just be one more sign that he really can't grasp anything remotely complicated. It could be that thousands is true in this case, in the same way that Shakespeare lived more than 50 years ago is true. Picard comes by to ask the Breckians to consider helping the two twitchy guys in his sick bay, and while there's initial resistance, she persuades Chet here that they should share a dose with each of them for humanitarian reasons. The medicine, Felicium, can deal with holding it back for 72 hours, but then another dose is required. Crusher finds all this deeply suspicious, but Picard wonders about the arrangement here. The Brachians have only one industry, to make Felicium for the Anarans, and the Anarans then trade the things the Brachians need to make up for not growing food or manufacturing stuff. It's a symbiotic relationship, as the title states. Or is it? Turns out the treatment is actually a narcotic. Data found out that Inara took a path of technological advancement, while Breca did not. But when the plague hit 200 years ago, their technology couldn't solve it. The plant on Breca could, except it couldn't be transplanted to their planet. Hence the arrangement to supply the drug from the plant to treat the plague, except the plague's already cured. Now they're just addicted to the drug. Well, that sucks. However, Picard notes, You can't let them have the Felicium. Why? Because it offends against our sensibilities? 
you know, for once, me and season one Picard are on the same page. This is exploitation. But it's not their job to fly around looking for what we consider injustice and righting the wrong. I mean, this is reprehensible, but this really is a case where stepping in could genuinely make things worse. Yeah, I'm not really a big fan of turning a blind eye to exploitation, but this really is the lesser of two evils. However, you don't just get my rant today. As soon as Picard, Riker, and Crusher leave, it opens the door to Wesley asking about why anyone would choose to, quote, become dependent on a chemical, which, as I said, is fully in keeping with the writing of this episode. Tasha uses this to explain that drugs are used by those who feel there's no escape from their wretched existence, even though it doesn't actually solve anything. Which I suppose is true, but frankly, in the situation, it seems like it's just one more problem out of a whole lot of bad ones. And you know what really lets me appreciate this abject poverty of living? Sobriety! And that leaves out a whole lot of other things from this time, when people were making six or seven figures and then snorting blow. Where does that fit into this calculus? Drug use needs more than a minute and a half to have a nuanced conversation on, and this just makes Wesley's The More You Know uniform top here emphasize this is just a silly, simplified PSA. I don't do drugs. The woman on the spaceship told me not to. The reason the trio left is that the boss on the planet called up to ask where the fix is for their people. You would take us to our planet and leave us there with our medicine or this person dies. Ooh, dirty pool whip out the old lightning claw. He tries to make demands, but Picard won't listen. We're not going to listen to you under duress. Maybe we should hear them out. The guy finally lets him go. He's not a killer. He just wants to save his people which is what he thinks the drugs will do. Well, the Brackians get involved next and say they've decided to give the drugs on credit this time. They can pay for it whenever. That tips Picard off to what actually happened. The Brackians were infected by the plague, cured themselves, realized the cure is a narcotic, so they kicked the habit but let the Anarans continue to believe they were sick, even making the drug more potent to ensure quitting would be harder. They're willing to hand over the Felicium to the Anarans to ensure that they don't realize they don't need it anymore. But thanks to the old PD, there's nothing that they can do to interfere. If the Breckians are giving the Felicium to the Anarans and the Anarans want it, that's unfortunately their choice. And telling them what's going on would be intentionally disrupting the relationship between these two. You would be choosing to deliberately alter events. Yeah, I'd like to end what is clearly exploitation here, too. But you know, if you do that, if you tell them what's happening, it could easily drive the Anarans to declare war on the Breckians, who don't have any technology to resist them. With a few ill-chosen words, you could lead to an enslavement or a genocide. Like I said, this isn't our continent's going to flip upside down through no fault of our own, would you mind helping us? This is a case of the lesser of two evils. However, Picard pulls a wacky trick by saying that they won't interfere. At all. Not even by giving the parts needed to fix the Alaran ships. So yeah, this can continue, provided the Breckians can learn how to flap their arms and hold their breath for a really long time. And this isn't just a clever trick on Picard's part. It's ensuring not just the letter, but the spirit of the Prime Directive is being followed. The actions of these societies had led them to this moment where their space travel ability is so deteriorated that it's going to end. And now their actions will lead to wherever things lead from here. They're not helpless victims to fate. They're left self-determined beings to choose their fate. Post-episode follow-up? Annoying character goes to Wesley for prompting the just-say-no conversation. I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised. This was when everyone was doing a very special episode. But, woof. Final score for symbiosis is a bit hard to pin down. There's a push-pull here for me in that I want to show my appreciation for the Prime Directive coming up and being used properly you know, to ensure white man's burden condescension doesn't become our mandate out here. But this script is rough. It's a between-two-stools kind of episode in that if it would have been a couple years later, then a more talented writing team would have been able to work on it, except that instead of fixing what needed fixing, It'd just go and wind up with a B-plot instead and just trim out all the stuff that had potential in this. 
I'm going to err on the side of positive and give this a score of 5 out of 10, as the quality of it represents that which you expect from TNG, even though it's got its rough patches. The episode probably illustrates how Season 1 sometimes had ideas that just didn't have the talent to deliver them to the fullest, but some of those ideas were stuff TNG wouldn't have thought to use when they had stronger talent to call upon. you bench oh we don't do it for the numbers we do it to quiet the voices in our heads nice i do 250 